Hello, ladies and gentlemen, fellow wrestlers out there, and uh, welcome to uh, our April 10th uh, edition of the Samurai Brothers Wrestling Podcast. Uh, this is episode eight. Uh, I'm John, here with my brother Matthew. Uh, Matthew, uh, nice to see you as always. And uh, before we really kick off the festivities, Matthew, happy birthday to you. Oh, yeah, and, thank you. Which was yesterday. Yep. So... Uh, anyway, so Matthew, uh, I think, uh, you know, things have kind of, you know, in, in certain aspects, they're kind of winding down a bit, um, although there are plenty of, uh, you know, there's international competition going on, and then there's always, uh, you know, every weekend right now across the country, there are freestyle and Greco tournaments going on, as well as some local uh, folk style tournaments so that everyone can kind of just, you know, stay in stay in practice, stay in shape, and uh, getting ready for the upcoming seasons. Um, you know, there's going to be people trying to get on to the, get to the world team trials, you know, in order to represent the, the U.S., and then there's uh, people just wanting to get ready for the upcoming school seasons for 2022, 2023. So, but, uh, you know, as always, uh, things go on, and we just talk about you know, what, what um, big topics come up. So uh, at least for this week, you know, uh, while we're waiting for everything to kind of come up and, and more stuff to come our way, I thought we'd uh, talk, you know, kind of go away from competition a little bit and just talk about uh, a variety of uh, uh, topics today. So uh, I wanted to start first with some, uh, some news uh, articles I've been reading into and stuff that you know, maybe get your take on it and see what you think uh, of what go what's going on right now. So uh, we'll go ahead and begin. And um, first, uh, first thing I want to talk about was, and uh, I was seeing a, uh, I was seeing this post from USA Wrestling's uh, uh, IG, uh, and uh, apparently there is a, a wrestler, uh, Mr. James Green, and uh, he has decided to announce his retirement from active competition. Uh, he's a two-time world medalist. He's a six-time world, uh, six-time member of the world team. And he decided to retire from active competition uh -huh. last Friday. But uh, with that being said, so uh, this post that uh, he put out on IG, <coughs> says, uh, I have done everything I possibly could do as a competitor in wrestling. Regardless of the results, I gave it my all with no questions asked. What I can do mentally and what I can do physically are two different things. After a lot of talk and discussion, I'll be stepping away from the competitive side of wrestling and putting on my coaching hat. Nothing is guaranteed in this life, and we must control what we can control. I can't wait to share my knowledge of the sport with the next generation. Much love. Laceman out. So, with that being said, Matthew, so uh, uh, now James Green is going to become Coach Green. And uh, at, at least according to USA Wrestling's uh, press release, he has been named National Freestyle Developmental Coach. So, he's going to be one of the coaches helping with, uh, you know, training up to, I mean, you know, do you, do you think he just, uh, you know, he saw that maybe, you know, with with how competitive it can be out there, you know, uh, especially in the USA. USA is probably one of the the most competitive places in order to try and get on the on the world team. Uh, what do you think about the fact that you know he's deciding that you know he's stepping away and uh, you know wanting to find success as, as coaching? Well, let's see. Um, how uh, how old is he? So I would say that if I were to uh, look look him up right now, James Green Wrestling. So oh, he's actually kind of a he's uh he's twenty nine years old right now. Well, let's face it. At that point, tip in the and this is this is an average. Typically, by your late twenties, competitively, you're starting to wind down. Typically, there's obviously exceptions to other sports, but, um, but yeah, by that time in wrestling, you're typically, you know, there's a lot of guys out there, all the NCAA wrestlers who are going to try to compete 
at the world stage. They've graduated and they're on the full-time circuit. And um, so, yeah, I would say that the likelihood is that he's probably, um, he's at that stage where he would, it would be expected to retire. I think, I think Kale was pretty, I think he was about Kale's age when he won that Olymp, that gold medal and then he decided that was it. So, um, although Kale actually, um, 10 years ago or so, he actually did come out of retirement and, and did qualify for the world teams. And I think he took a fifth or something at the, at the world championships. But uh, that's kind of an unusual thing to do, don't you know? At least from from Kale's perspective. <laughs> yeah, I guess he just wanted to see if he could he could test himself. But you know, at that point, he was you know, well, wasn't he? He was in his late thirties when he, he would have been in his thirties. Yes. Yeah. That. So. Um... So uh, it, it, just to kind of go over what uh, like we see the we see that happen all the time. Like I think Stefan Abbas, even after he retired, he actually went for it. Actually went as far as the finals, but um, ultimately didn't um, make it. And Ste- you know, to me, Stefan Abbas is just another one of those examples of why a program clearly is not a. a you can't gauge how a program's going to get cut by the competition of the wrestlers. Because Stefan Abbas was a three-time champion. Shortly after that, Fresno State cut the program. And, like, the year after, Oregon, not Oregon State, Oregon, the Ducks, had a NCAA champion, they cut their program. Shortly after, UCLA had a NCAA champion, they cut their program. So you can't really gauge it by... Um, individual competition and then the latest example would be stanford you know almost lost their program and then they had an ncaa champion so if they'd lost that then that would have been their last year so you can't you cannot gauge a uh yeah you can't gauge success from the comp the performance of uh oh you can't gauge security Mm -hmm. I'll, i'll say but that was just you know, something I thought I'd so, just, a, just a short summary of uh, James Green's uh, career. Uh, he was a uh, four-time uh, NCAA All-American uh, for Nebraska, and uh, he was also a, a Big Ten uh, champion uh, during his uh, collegiate years and uh, did a lot of uh, competition on the, on the world, world <laughs> stage and such. And uh, so let me see where uh, – did he actually make the world team? So, think- yes, he did make the world teams. He was a silver medalist at the World University Championships in 2014. Uh, silver medalist at the Yasar Dogu uh, tournament actually this year. Uh, so, oh, so he was, he was pretty active. He, he was pretty active. Uh, he was a two-time Pan American champion. Uh, at the World Cup, he took a silver in 2017 and a gold at 2018. And then at on the world championship stage, uh, he took a bronze at the world championships in 2015 that took place in Vegas. And then at the Paris World Championships in 2017, he was a silver medalist. I'd say that was pretty respectable. And then, like I said, I think you probably realize, you know what, the, my career's winding down. My body's not as strong as it used to be. Well, well, because because let's look at it this way: we stopped competitively wrestling after college. Well, you mm-hmm. you you did JC, and then you kind of stopped. Uh, you know, once you got into the, it's a Fullerton where you, you probably didn't even have a chance of walking on. So, where you know, whereas I actually went all four years, and of note, I'm the only one of our siblings who went all four years. Now, granted, obviously, like I said, you had your competitive thing, but then our sister, you know, she um. She did swimming and then she got burnt out. Though to, I have to admit, towards the end, I was getting burnt out too because that's yeah, it's tough. It's a it's a tough thing to do. And well, then of course, especially... and then of course, one of the reasons why, like I said, I stopped was just because you know I re- you know, I was I didn't even you know, like I said, Jackson didn't even take me to regionals, and like I said, I don't blame him. I was not the best. He could only take twelve. There are fourteen of us, and 
he thought that uh, he thought that the, even though the you know the guys who would have replaced who replaced me didn't um, qualify, he thought he had took the best team. And objectively speaking, I think I'm pretty sure he did. So it's it's not one of those things where so, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's hard and some and you know it's just it's just hard to keep going at that level. And, well, I th- I and, think what and like I said, I got burnt out in my uh, got burnt out in my early twenties. So but here's something. So uh, here's something that he said uh, that I think uh, applies to anyone really. It's uh what I can do mentally and what I can do physically. You know, you think you can, you know, once you try to get back in there, you think that you can do something, but man, when you, when you've been out, when you've been out of it for so long, and then when you're trying to, you know, do a double leg takedown and you're thinking that you're going to get a quick shot in there uh, against someone, especially if you've like gained some weight over the years, like you and I have, and then we're trying to go out there and, and, you know, trying to shoot a quick double leg takedown or a single A, it's like, it's not going to work. I either. remember the last time I hit the mats was probably a few years ago. It was one of our Santa, the Santa Ana practices. And yeah, it's all well, just doing the basic running around, just like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm on the moon. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good way of and, thinking. And we're not talking like, I feel like I'm on the moon, like I'm light as a feather. It's like, no, I feel like I'm on the moon and I, I'm having trouble, like... Can't move at all. Yeah, because let's face it, in zero gravity, it's very hard to move. Or low gravity on the moon. But yeah, it's just... So that's, you know, and uh, you know, so anyway... You get in there and you actually try to do it and you're like... I remember you when you, you and I did some live wrestling... And then I was dominating you, but then after a few minutes, I'm like, <laughs> and I started getting back at you. <laughs> <laughs> and I had, and I was so, I was so out of shape. I was like, my thought was, oh, I think I'm gonna throw up. So I, I didn't throw up, but I was out, I was outside because I genuinely thought I was gonna throw up because I've overexerted myself before, and I was just like, oh, I, uh, that's why you got to If you want to get back into it, you got to start slow. And obviously, if you want to get. You want to really get into it, you got to get that cardio back up. And that's, that's, I think the yeah, but cardio, is what a I, lot of I'm, people are Yeah, missing. but I'm going to note, it's like, you probably have this experience too, that, you know, when, when you just get in the mat and you just want to, you just want to go, but then yeah, you, you want to go, but then after about, then you realize, yeah, your body's not there. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, you want to do like, something. you're all of a sudden, yeah, you're overexerting yourself beyond what you're able to do. So. Coat, uh, I'll tell you what, sitting, working at home and stuff, you know, during COVID, I, it hasn't helped either. Like, I I probably gained, you know, 20 pounds just from staying at home, not doing much. But that's why I think, you know, it's, a, you know, some people were able to work it out. They, they, some people, like, I've seen some people lately that just, they, they lost weight, you know, even during these times. So there's, there's no way to do it. So you know, well, our dad, our dad never gained weight. He just went from <laughs> working out in the gym to working out in the house. Yeah. So that's anyway, our freak, um, of, know, nature, for... dad, our freak of nature. Dad, I really do think if he like committed himself to one specific sport, he probably could have gone somewhere, but he never really had an interest in one particular sport. He was just an overall good athlete, but I honestly think he could have gone places if he, if he didn't. And honestly, I really do think if he decided to go to the Masters tournament and he committed himself, he probably could actually do well, even though he wasn't really any kind of a competitive wrestler when he was, you know, in his younger days. So, so we got to, we'll, we'll have to go ourselves first and then we'll have to try and see if we can, you know, because he would, he, he would be able to fit into a Masters bracket. It's just a matter of convincing him to go. So with that, that yeah, don't they said, have like a 70 plus? Oh, no, he's not that old. Don't they have like a 60 plus or something? I do. I do. Um, so with that being said, Matthew. Um, for, those, for those, the majority of people have not seen our father. He looked, he, he does not look 60. 61. He's going to turn 61 this year. He does not look 61. He looks like a man in his 40s. 
So, Matthew, with that being said, uh, so best of luck to uh, James Green with uh, his uh, going the coaching route. And, uh, and you know, I'm glad, he, I'm glad that he got the coaching position that he did because, you know, there's so many good wrestlers. And typically they do rotate the coaches with the national teams. So I'm glad that they were able to find a position for him. So uh, with that being said, I want to move on to our next uh, news uh, that I found that uh, would be interesting. And I actually want to cover this last week, but we kind of ran out of time, so I never brought it up. But so, um, you know, it does look like that there are going to be a string of uh, NCAA uh, recruits uh, that will be transfer or not recruits, but, you know, current uh, current wrestlers, you know, at various uh, schools that will be transferring here and there. Now, the real big name that I guess came up when I was looking at the Flow article, and uh, unfortunately, I can't really get uh, see the full list of who's transferring because of because uh, of the paywall, you know. And again, hey, that that that's life. But you know, the the person that they did make available for seeing that they're going to transfer is uh, Stanford All American Real Woods. Uh, has declared that he is going to wrestle uh, next upcoming school year for Iowa. And uh, so that that's something that, you know, hey, he wants to he wants to really get himself out there. Now I, I do have the uh, my, my nifty list of all Americans from the NCAA tournament uh, from this last uh, season. And uh, so he took uh, sixth place at, 141 pounds uh, for Stanford. So he was one of the uh, All-Americans this year. But, uh, you know, from, from what I'm, I'm seeing about, you know, the fact that he wants to transfer out, uh, seems like he wants to, from the way I'm seeing it, it seems that, you know, he wants to, you know, he did a, he felt he did a good job at Stanford, obviously, and, you know, he helped contribute to keeping the program. But it looks like from, you know, the fact that you want to go from Stanford to Iowa must mean that he felt that he could only do so much at Stanford, but he probably feels like he can go even further going to a major, major powerhouse program like Iowa. I mean, Matthew, what would – what would be your take on the fact that, you know, he'd be going from, you know, the West Coast out to wrestling country back East? Well, I guess the, I guess the best question is what weight would he be aiming at? Because in, in order to make sure you could actually, um, I, like, he's got to be confident that if he was going out there, he'd be able to make the lineup. And knowing so, Iowa, they've probably got, two or three deep, well, yeah, they've probably got like two or three deep depending on the weight class. So, so here, here's what I'm seeing, at least from that. So uh, when Real Woods uh, placed at the NCAAs, it was at 141 pounds. Now, the 141 pounder for Iowa was Ironman, who we know got knocked out a bit early. Uh, and I believe that was because of his, in, you know, his injury. Uh, because he ended up losing to Clark from UNC, I believe. That was that one match that was the really big ups, you know, one of the bigger upsets of the of the tournament was Ironman, you know, I as the uh, as the two seed losing out to uh, Clark. So uh, from what I'm seeing though, uh, Ironman is a redshirt senior. So my guess is that means that he is, uh, out after this year, unless somehow he got a uh, fifth year of eligibility, but this this might have been that eligibility. Okay. Well, so. my I would say that I would say that yeah. Um, if 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 it's strategic and he talked to brands, and because uh, I would imagine he would have had to talk to brands and figure out if he could actually. Um, you know, fit into the lineup and stuff like that. So if he's uh, if he's going out there, um, I would say it's probably he's probably at least confident that he could make the lineup. So, because yeah, but, yeah, 
Well, obviously, he's looking for a national championship if he really thinks that maybe not just individual team wise as well. And he probably feels that even though Stanford had a national, you know, a national champion, they're not exactly known for their national champions. So and the wrestling especially. So my guess is he's probably he probably does think that he could learn enough under brands to be able to uh, win an NCAA championship next year. Yep, yep. And uh, I'm I'm looking at uh, Iowa's roster right now, and uh, we'll actually be going over this later as as a uh, part of uh, another segment of our. Uh, of the podcast today but uh it looks like e- even if you were to do 41 or 49s you know it, it looks like they have their their four deep in each weight class and um i guess that's that's probably how much they're allowed to have on the full roster at, at iowa so you know they've got you know four 41 pounders and four 49 pounders and uh but you know um each each weight class does have um, at least one outgoing, you know, um, uh, well, for 49 pounds, they have two outgoing seniors. And then at uh, 141 pounds, they've got Ironman uh, on his way out. So he's probably, again, like you're saying, he's probably figuring on, you know, some strategic moves there. So we'll have to see how that goes for him, uh, you know. Uh, you know, anything goes in this uh, in the world right now, I mean, we saw well, how. Well, yeah, because let's face it, he could go there, and the guy who's been sitting on the bench this whole time might beat him in the varsity lineup, and you know, this this could backfire on him. But it could pay dividends for him. He could go in there and he could become a national champion, not just not just in um, uh, not just as an individual, but also as part of the team. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Yep, we'll have to wait and see. So, uh, you know, and if we see some other transfers, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll be sure to make note of that uh, in later episodes if we're, if that opportunity does come up. So, hey, you know, there's, there's a person. I mean, this is nothing new, though. You know, athletes are always entering the the transfer portal in the NCAA's, and and you know, I think a, a notable example as far as wrestling is is concerned would be um, Math. I think you remember Steve Mako. Uh, you know, he, he did that before the transfer portal existed. Mm-hmm. Back then, the tr- back then, you know, you had to get signed off. And I remember a few guys coming to Mobat who transferred, who because their coaches wouldn't sign off, they were, or I'm not sure if it's the coach or the athletic department, but essentially they got they lost a year of eligibility. I think it was probably because of stuff like that that the tra- NCAA created the transfer portal. And I'm sure that the NAI has something similar. I don't know because uh, I just haven't checked it out. But I'm sure I, stuff like that and probably some stuff in the major sports, like I'm sure stuff in basketball and football probably existed as well. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of stuff factored into eventually uh, the transfer portal being created and allowing guys to actually transfer without losing eligibility and having to go through all the other paperwork. Right, because uh, I, I I do know how, um, especially out here in California, uh, where you have the three C two A's, which is the California Community College um, athletics uh, programs, and uh, more often than not, you know, it's actually kind of surprising. You will see uh, dropbacks, uh, you know, meaning that you have wrestlers who did go to four year uh, universities and they decided it just wasn't. For them and you know they'll they'll come back to California and so you know they they drop back meaning that they they come down you know to that level uh at the three C two A's and um what they're able to do because they have at least another year of eligibility and the right they they usually end up you know having uh, if they if they didn't wrestle competitively then they'll have you know at least one more year of eligibility they might have wrestled their their sophomore year and uh, I think uh, a notable example of that was, uh, if uh, you remember my talking about this, so at the, at the 2021 3C2A championships last year in December, uh, West Hills had three individual champions, even though, you know, uh, but the rest of their team didn't do as well, so they weren't really a contender for the title, but they had three individual champions. 
And as I, as I came to find out, you know, all three of those, those wrestlers who won the 3C2A title were dropbacks from the recently um, shut down, you know, newly revived Fresno State program. And the, the, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that the, the current West Hills head coach, he's an alumni of, you know, Fresno State, you know, back in the, back in the 80s. So I'm sure that that had, you know, to do a lot with, you know, hey, he wanted to, I'm sure these, these wrestlers were all local. And so he decided to recruit them to West Hills and, you know, they went out and they got their, their championships. Uh, another um, wrestler that comes to mind, at least, you know, from where I come from, you know, uh, from Santa Ana College was a, a wrestler named Ted Bristol, who uh, he wrestled for Cal State Fullerton. He did wrestle a year there. And then uh, after that, you know, he, I don't know if it had to do with the lineup or something, but he decided to drop back and he wrestled for Santa Ana College. And the year he wrestled was the year that SAC took their third state title back in 2009. So he was really an integral part of that. But, you know, so you'll, you'll have that happen, I think, quite a lot. And, you know, again, you know, you saw a lot of wrestlers come in through MOBAT, meaning that they were probably at the NCAA level and decided to, to kind of uh, drop back, as you would call it. Uh, yeah, there were there were several of them from uh, there were several guys who yeah went to the NCAA level and kind of realized that uh, it, it wasn't competitively for them. Oh. So, well, it wasn't just to Mobap. Like um, uh, you know, back when we were in Japan, there was a family of wrestlers named the Olanowskis, and uh, all those that generation of of, uh, of boys are all done wrestling. But the, um, the second oldest, the oldest, uh, Justin, ended up wrestling at, in the NCWA level. But the second oldest, Johnny, who was about two years um, older than me, he wrestled at Missouri. After about a year, he didn't, um, it might have been a few years, but uh, he ended up going down to Lindenwood. Mm. Uh, and it's funny because he didn't even remember who I was, but he did remember, oh, yeah, Japan. <laughs> so <coughs> we were to talk a little bit about the you know, stuff there. But, but yeah, there's that example. Um, there were two brothers named the Bowman brothers who my freshman year, the older brother had gone to I northern Iowa. Mm. And didn't like it there, so he, um, yeah, he came down and he uh, he wrestled um, a. I can't remember if it was just a year or a second year. Those 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 those. That's another example of the guys who don't hang around. Um, yeah. Oh, you know. There was a lot of stuff going on at Mobap at the time. My understanding is it's a little bit more stable. They're able to keep um, more guys there, but I think that's just a normal thing where, yeah, the. Um, you, you've got a good number of freshmen or younger classmen who come in to a program and they kind of realize it's not for them. Um, I'm just, one example I'm going to throw out there is that um, Bill Park, you know, um, I can name a few different guys. Um, let's see, um, I know for a fact it was Buck Barger. Buck Barger, Bo Reynolds, Emmanuel Hernandez, they they all went to uh, wrestle. Buck actually went to Iowa State. Uh, Bo went to Cal State Bakersfield, and then uh, Emmanuel went to William Penn, and um, which was in AI. But um, uh, Buck and Bo, it, a, I think they kind of realized that um, – Four year wrestling wasn't for them, uh, or, uh, I, or the P1 wrestling particularly wasn't for them. So they ended up drop. Um, they end up, well, let's see. Buck ended up just not wrestling after he finished up. Bo actually transferred back to SAC 
and so did E-Man. I can't, and, um, E-Man specifically um, actually did make the, uh, the varsity lineup. So that's just that's just another example where yeah they, you know it's just it's just whatever and then they go back to uh, another level trying to see if think they can be competitive so so anyway so yeah that's that's how things are going with those those transfers so um and then so here's here's a here's a big one Matthew uh really big uh news I would like to point something out with regards to programs that are dropped my understanding is the um the what's it called the sports programs basically say that they will still honor the um scholarships of the guys who uh decide to basically stay so they're basically gonna get paid to you know not not compete essentially so and I could see how for like some of the guys who are like essentially bench warmers who probably wouldn't have done it anyways, they'd just want to get the education so they just keep going. Obviously, the more competitive guys, like as we saw with Fresno State, those guys were like, no, we want to compete. So they decided to, you know, wrestle for West Hills. And of note, we should probably bring up the fact that, you know, Fresno State, or no, Fresno City, the pro, the reason why, another reason why they probably didn't res, wrestle at Fresno City was because of the fact that, as we've established, the Fresno Clovis area is a snake pit, and that uh, a lot of guys who can't wrestle straight out of a four year from all those those Clovis schools are going to go to um, are going to go to Fresno City. Yes. That's I correct. Think the, I think the joke there is that some of these guys are probably the bench warmers who could only make junior varsity and couldn't beat the guys who are like placing in state. Well, I'll have to tell you, probably a lot of those guys would be considered quote unquote JV at Clovis or Buchanan would probably whoop some butt down here on some of the varsity. Oh, yeah, they probably would have whooped my butt. You know. I remember wrestling a guy from, I think, one of the Clovis schools, and I just got cl my clock cleaned. I got pinned. So, so you, yeah, so you, so you wrestled a, you wrestled a, a guy from the Clovis. It was area. the El Dorado tournament, senior year, El, the El Dorado tournament. I wrestled a guy in Clovis in the the placing round, and the guy pinned me. <laughs> yeah, Jake Varner style. You do you remember how you used to be able to do a figure four around the head? Yeah, that's <laughs> that's that's what I got. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just the level up there versus the level down here, you know, where so you're we at. Talked, we talked about how um we talked about how the uh, the what's it called? The um how one of those Clovis school duels was behind the paywall of flow wrestling. Yes, yes. <laughs> It'll be behind, yes, it'll be behind like, the table. I, like, I don't, I don't know if, I don't, like, I don't know if, if, if other schools will actually, like, post some of their live performances, but they, they would do it on YouTube. Like, I, hypothetically speaking, you know, if it was, like, Villa Park or Elmo or El Dorado. Yeah, if they were doing it. If they were doing it, they would, they would just be putting, setting up a camera and posting it on YouTube. If, if it was not live, then they would just, yeah, that's what they would be doing. But the fact not of the matter the, is. Not the case with the Clovis area schools. Right. Well, no, because because of the fact that you're going to have, you know, Clovis, um, you know, whether it's Clovis or Clovis North or Buchanan, those three schools are consistently, you know, in, in the top ten, if not top five, you know, all three could theoretically be in the top five, you know, in the same year. But normally I think it would be, you know, they're going to be in the top 10, at least as far as the California rankings are concerned. And then there are all three of those schools are definitely going to be in at least the top 25 nationally. So, you know, I, I, I get how flow would, you know, um, because a, a lot of people will want to, will want to watch that match because they're going to want to see what's going on. And it probably that way, 
you know, as far as, as uh, college recruiters are concerned, you know, they'll probably want to see, hey, you know, what's going to what's going to be the action between, you know, uh, Buchanan and, and the Clovis schools. Not necessarily that that's going to guarantee that, you know, whoever's wrestling is, you know, guaranteed, a, um, you know, a recruiting opportunity, but I think it definitely creates interest. Yeah, it's certainly true. So with that being said, Matthew, uh, here's, a, here's one that I think you're going to be very happy to hear about. Uh, so on Friday, the NAIA formally voted to adopt women's wrestling as their 28th national championship sport. Ah. They have uh, women's wrestling in the NAIA has, uh, they have satisfied the conditions for having 40 institutions sponsoring the sport as a varsity program. So, uh, Again, the uh, NAIA um, National Administrative Council uh, voted to approve women's wrestling. So, and this took place at the NAIA National Convention. Um, so actually, I have the date wrong. They, they voted on this on Saturday, uh, which was yesterday. So uh, with that being said, though, um, again, uh, from CEO... NAI President and CEO Jim Carr, this is a great day for the sport of wrestling and all of our women's wrestling student athletes. Women's wrestling has seen sustained growth. We are proud to become the first collegiate athletics association to offer this as a championship sport. Um, now, with that being said, uh, they uh, the article here does not say whether or not it's going to formally start this upcoming 22-23 season or if it's going to start, you know, 23, 24. If I were to have to guess, it might start 23, 24 as an official program because I'm very sure, uh, like they're saying, um, they have to now meet to actually work out how that, how that system is going to work out, how they're going to move everybody around and stuff. Now, they are saying that they will... Uh, you know, they got to work on the championship format, which I guess that means, you know, how many, how many teams are going, or how many, how big of a bracket are you going to have for the, for the championship? And then of course, you know, the, the women's wrestling, they do freestyle, you know, uh, compared to men's wrestling where they do collegiate style. So that's another thing too. You, you're going to have to get uh, USA wrestling officials to be able to do that event, you know, how do you work your qualifiers? Are you going to have one, two, three, you know, regionals? How does that work out? You know, how will they do duels and stuff? So it says that they are going to work on that. And then they will announce during the summer how that'll work out. Again, my guess is I think it's going to be too soon to have a official national championship in 22-23. So I, I personally believe that they will probably start in 23-24. But Matthew, give us your take on, on this. You know, the fact that we, we now have a, a athletic body finally um, recognizing women's wrestling. So there will be a national, an official national championship. And the other thing I have to have to ask and, and get your opinion on is how how soon do you think that the NCAA will follow suit on this? Well, obviously, um, the NAIA has been more proactive in this than the NCAA. The NAIA had already started doing an invitational uh, tournament, an official women's invitational tournament before the NCAA had even... Um, admitted women's wrestling into their emerging sports program. And from the sound of it, the from the sound of it, the NAI has something similar to the NCA emerging women's emerging sports program, but it, it probably is less formal because even though the NAI adopts a lot of the rules that the NCAA does, they don't completely They've been doing that a lot more in recent years, but certain other um, 
cer certain other um, stuff that they work on is uh, not always uh, has not always been um, adapted. They, they're a little bit more um, they're a little bit a little bit more loose with their rules um, in general and stuff like that. So, but it does sound, and it might be because of that, that they've been able to adopt this a little bit sooner. But I do agree, it might take a little bit longer. We might see a, um, we might see a, um, another invitational tournament uh, before the fall, unless they're going to try to, because, um, you know, the next, it's a ways off. If they try to fast track it, they could this could um be done conceivably be done by next by next season conceivably but i like you one i wouldn't be surprised if yeah they do maybe one or two more uh well one more uh invitational tournament but um yeah they've definitely taken a step so, like I said, based off of the fact that the NCAA is a little bit more bureaucratic, they've got more procedures and stuff like that, it might take a few more years longer. Now, one thing to remember is that the um, NCAA Women's Emerging Sports Program has a specific deadline. You have a decade once the, pro once the um, sport is admitted for, to meet the, the uh, minimums. So, uh, and they started in, I think, 2018 or 2019. But my understanding was by the time that they already started it, they were already in the 30s and late 30s in terms of. Yes, the there's, there's a number. Well, and um, I, I think one of the things is that this applies across all three levels, does it not? Or does it have to be a specific division? I don't know because there's certain NCAA sports where there's just one division just because of a lack of, uh, of competition. So it's possible that um, at least for the time being, there's probably just going to be one division. I think that there's, I think there's got to be certain minimums in order for, and even then, you know, there might be um, a split. There might not. There might not be the set D one, D two, D three in certain. Like I don't know if there's just a D two in um, any sport, but I would imagine if any, if there would have to be like X number of programs to develop in order to justify se uh, separating into a division. So. Um, but yeah, I think the NCAA is on its way, and I do think it's it'll probably it will. Let's see, I was not starting their program this year, right? They're starting it next year. Uh, the program I think is starting up uh, this year, as far as I know. I do. I, I think that might push it to the minimum. So yeah, I think right now as I, would, I would like to say that would push it to the minimum uh, I do know that I do know that um, uh, like for example uh, Iowa does have an official page for women's wrestling um, obviously they don't have uh, unlike the other sports uh, they don't have any schedule or roster because they aren't starting yet but if you, you know, they, they're talking about who all is coming in, um, you know, they're get like, uh, they just released uh, something about, you know, they're getting, they're getting an, an, um, an NAI All-American to transfer to Iowa. So, uh, you know, I think, I think, I think what, what's happening, a lot of these women, you know, if, if they're seeing the opportunity that, Iowa, you know, the, the Iowa name is going to give to them. I think they're wanting to really, you know, add that to their resume as far as 
uh, you know, credentials as far as, you know, wrestling achievements are, are concerned here. But it, it does look to me like they are going to have the program starting up. Uh, you know, if we have to, you know, this, this, this goes back to, I think we did cover this uh, in, in our, uh, one of our earlier episodes. Uh, I do believe that, yes, the, the, the team is supposed to be starting, you know, this year. Now, obviously, it will still be one of those things where it's going to be, you know, not – uh, they're they're only going to be able to go to women's tournaments that are, you know, out there. But you you can't compete in in an official NCAA championship. So I would imagine that you know Iowa is still going to be on the uh, I think it's the NCWWA right now, as far as the championships are concerned. Right. But it, it looks like to me, uh, yeah, like uh, their press release. I'm looking at Iowa, you know, their press release from, you know, last year, back in September of last year. Iowa is is currently, I, I don't know if it is the only, but it's the first major Power 5 school to sponsor women's wrestling. And um, this, is, this is something that I think will be interesting to look up uh, later. It's, you know, how many Power 5 schools are actually – or, you know, Power 5 schools are sponsoring the sport versus, you know, either a group of five or, you know, any of the other uh, schools out there that aren't part of the group of five, uh, you know, that are sponsoring uh, women's wrestling. And, again, as, as uh, I've explained before, that, you know, they, there's some schools that they don't sponsor men's wrestling, but they do sponsor women's wrestling. And that, I think, you know, we'll be seeing that uh, coming up soon, too. So I think it'll be interesting to do a side-by-side comparison to see how are we doing so far, you know, in, in one, you know, men's wrestling versus women's wrestling. Uh, second thing is, you know, power five schools versus group of five schools. And then any of the other, you know, like basketball only schools, you know, because they're, they're you know, the way all the, all the conferences are aligned, you know, in, in the NCAA, you know, it. I, I think it could be. It could get complicated and confusing. Just you know, trying to remember who's who. And so that you know, I think just with the, the the Iowa name, I think that's why a lot of these girls are wanting to go to Iowa, just because hey, it's the Iowa name. Iowa has always been a big wrestling school. Hey, you know, it's Gable it's Brands. Clarissa Chun is going to be the 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 head coach for women's wrestling. I mean. You know, hey, yeah, uh, I, I, I would have to think, hey, what girl would not want to go wrestle for Clarissa Chun? So, uh, again, so with that being said, which, which also, um, I kind of want to uh, segue a little bit, um, just to kind of give people uh, uh, an. Here's, here's another interesting article that I found, which was, uh, this was by USA Wrestling, and they put out a, um, they put out a article saying they're, they're advertising head coaching positions for a lot of these schools that are starting to turn up uh, for head coaching opportunities because they're, they're, they're making women's programs. So let me let me read you. So the NCWA has shared a list of women's college openings to consider uh, head coach positions, uh, and these are all either D two, D three, or NAIA. So you've got Alvernia uh, in Pennsylvania. You've got Bluefield State in West Virginia. Cedar Crest from Pennsylvania. Concordia from uh, Wisconsin. Uh, you got Cornell Does College. Does Wisconsin have a men's program? I thought they did. So I know Concordia, Nebraska has a men's program. Oh, okay. 
Uh, you got Cornell College in Iowa. Now, this you pointed out to me a while ago. This this is the same Cornell College that won the NCAA D1 title back in the 50s, I think. And currently they compete at the D3 level. Yeah, the only D3 program that won a D1 championship. Uh, you've got uh, Dwayne uh, University in Nebraska for, and then Ferrum College, Virginia. That's uh, D3. Fontbonne University, uh, Grand Valley State University in Michigan, uh, Hiram College, Ohio, Jarvis Christian in Texas, Lords University in Ohio, Marymount University, Virginia, New England College in New Hampshire, uh, Ursinus College in Pennsylvania, Wartburg College in Iowa. Uh, if you remember, Matthew, Wartburg was the, the D3 school that had that collapse uh, in the, in the semifinal rounds at the D3 championships, but they held on to win by one point uh, at the D3 championships. Uh, you've got Wayland Baptist in Texas, and then Western New England College in Massachusetts. So I think just counting these uh, right then and there, you know, this is, they've got, there are at least 18 programs right now at the college level that are advertising for head coaches. You know, it, it, it seems to me that, you know, just women's wrestling is, it's, it's kind of exploding to the point where they're, they're, they're needing coaches. It is because um, a lot of colleges are, uh, are seeing the opportunity in this. They're seeing the opportunity to invest in a sport that's growing uh, and it's a historical sport. And it's a way to maintain Title IX. So, it like as as we said before, any expansion of the sport is good for the sport. You know, um, I'm gonna say this, and I'm not gonna name this person, but there's one person who believes that um, that uh, expansion of women's wrestling is not good because it's gonna result in Title IX killing off more men's programs. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it, this is going to function as a balance to maintaining men's programs. I really do think this is, this is good for the sport. I really do. The, this this explosion wow. of women's wrestling, you know, I've uh, you know we we from the beginning we always wrestled with women. Japan was was a lot more uh, advanced in that regards, and, and which is which is funny because um, you know. Um, well, and they were a bit integrated back then when we were wrestling too. Although now it, it, it's clearly separated out now, so you do have you know you you will clearly have women's divisions and men's divisions in in you know Japan. Although I do remember, like you're saying, you know we we would practice with girls and stuff, and um, you know up to a certain point, you know in like. Um, some of the elementary school tournaments over there, you know, they were having boys and girls wrestling in the same divisions because, you know, at that, you know, uh, they'd be kind of the kind of the same. Uh, level. At that stage, developmentally, the women, the the girls are about the same as the boys, and, and and then if you're talking about, you know, as they start to get closer to puberty, remember, women hit puberty faster than boys. So, if anything, I one point they're going to have an advantage so <laughs> so anyway yeah so you know this uh again a lot of uh you know a lot of opportunities and and uh, hopefully we're going to see how things go from there so uh with that being said you know i think hey uh we're one step closer to saying you know national championships in the ncaa's I think now that the NAIA has taken the initiative, so now it's, it's up to the NCAA to, to, you know, follow through. We'll have to see how it goes. I don't know if the uh, I don't know if ESPN would broadcast that, but I would want to watch that. But the an, an NCAA championship for women, I'd want to watch that. So uh, I kind of want to um, Matt do a, a mock uh, preview. Uh, you know, what we can expect, what we can be expecting from, uh, you know, 
our programs that, you know, will be trying to compete for the national title uh, in the, uh, the upcoming NCAA Division I season, 22-23. So just kind of a quick peek at uh, our top 14 programs that, that placed at the NCAA tournament. Now, if I'm looking at, you know, I'm, I'm looking and seeing, uh, first off, with uh, Oklahoma State, uh, you know, they have how many? They've got uh, four, no, looks like six outgoing uh, seniors and graduate students. Uh, among those, uh, if I'm looking at it, I do believe Dayton Fix, is he on there? Let me double check to make sure. Um, but I do know they have one returning. Uh, actually, I take that back. Dayton Fix, who finished second to Roman Bravo Young. Uh, he is a junior, so he will be coming back. Uh, now, uh, the interesting thing, uh, and I'll bring this up again later when we get to Penn State, is that Roman Bravo Young may or may not have another year of eligibility, even though he, is a, he was a senior this year. So I don't know how that would work out specifically, you know, if it's COVID, you know, uh, exception related or not. Uh, I'd find that kind of weird, but I would think that that's not going to be the case. So I would have to imagine that Dayton Fix is probably going to finally have his opportunity to get NCAA gold um, if uh, or either, you know, he's got to find his way around to beating RBY. Uh, if RBY does come back. Uh, so that was fixed. And then the other uh, wrestler that they had who was an All-American was Dustin Plott at 174 pounds, and he's a sophomore. So, you know, they, it looks like they do have two wrestlers coming back. Uh, you know, still a relatively young team, Matthew. Uh, as far as Oklahoma State's concerned, you think that, you know, maybe they might, you know, if they do have a, maybe a good recruiting class, class plus they're building up their younger team. You think maybe, I don't know, two, three years, maybe they could have something going, probably not this upcoming year. Yeah, this is one of those things where any program that's looking to uh, be competitive in the NCAA championships has to look at the long game. You need to recruit guys. You need to be able to foster these guys throughout their years. And uh, you, in, that's how you're eventually going to be able to have a good team that's probably going to uh, be able to um, maybe to win the NCAA championship. That's kind of what happened with John Smith during the mid-2000s, you know, four championship wins. He got these guys. He fostered them over several years. They became multiple-time All-Americans, and they were able to win. That, that's, you know, that included Johnny Hendricks, um, Jared Rochalt. Um, Mako kind of came in by accident, but it was, you know, it's, uh, you know, all these guys were these long term. Coleman Scott was another one. So, yeah, he was able to get all these guys. He was able to foster them and he was able to develop a, a championship team over a long term game. And he was very fortunate in that some of these guys, um, they started peaking early and he was able to over the long term, uh, win, you know, uh, win with these guys. Do you think, do you think maybe one of the things, and again, we don't, we don't know how everything is going, you know, back East, but do you think one of the things that maybe uh, the challenge for the big 12, as far as wrestling is concerned, is that all the, all the potential recruits or the really, um, the people who really have their eyes on the prize, do you think they're really going out more to the Big Ten than they're wanting to go to, you know, the Big 12? Because as you know, Oklahoma State is the, that's the storied program. They've got the most in NCAA history. Uh, but then you've got Iowa, you know, on, you know, who had Gable and then they've got Brands right now who has won three titles for Iowa. You've got Kale, who, you know, has just marched through, you know, the NCAAs with nine championships in the last 12 years or so. Do you think that, you know, people are kind of wanting to go more towards the Big Ten in terms of 
really wanting national championships or team building versus going out to the Big 12? Or do you think that, uh, you know, because Oklahoma State had to deal with a lot more injuries this year, that that was kind of what forced them to have it down here? Yeah, even yeah, well, even with the injuries, you know, I don't, I don't really think these guys because I forgot what what they place in in the championships. Uh, this this year, yeah, fourteenth, fourteenth. Yeah, even with, the even with that, if you look at all the guys across the board, I don't think they would have been. I mean, they would definitely would have been in the top ten. I don't know if they would have been in the top five. Maybe they could have got there, but the, the reality is they were not as strong across the board as some of the other schools like Iowa, Penn State, Michigan, you know, some of these, um, Arizona State even. That's another example is that, you know, you've got the, it is, um, <clears throat> again, you've got guys looking at the long game. As we established, Arizona State's a young team. So these guys could, and what, they placed fourth? So it's – Yeah, Arizona State plays for it. Yeah, it's yes. another one of those things where you got to look at the long game. You've got to, you've got to recruit, and then you've got to be able to foster these guys, develop loyalty, and they'll – they you know, you might be able to get a championship team in, in several years. So, like, um, I'm, I'm looking at uh, – And it's, now, yeah, it's just, and it's just one of those things where, yeah, because of the way things are now – um, you know, uh, but now because of the fact that uh, John Smith was able to get a team that was that he was able to foster and recruit, and as a result, recruits want to go to the, the team that if it, the top wrestlers who want to win championships are going to go to the teams that are winning. And as was established, yes, that's the Big 12 right now, they're either going to go to Iowa or they're going to go to Penn State. That's that's where they're going to go right now. Yeah, so, so they're, they're wanting to go to a, a Big Ten school, basically. Right. And that's another thing with Kale Sanderson where maybe he kind of realized, you know what, if I'm going to if I'm gonna be able to um, – because he, cause he could only do so much recruiting in Iowa because, you know, Iowa State, Iowa State, the fact of the matter is the, the bigger recruits are going to want to go to the big name, which is Iowa. You know, so I think he kind of realized that in order to find a better um, winning formula, he had to go somewhere else in order to figure that out. And so, it's possible that when Penn's, when the Penn State uh, opening came up, he realized, oh, Penn State, Pennsylvania has good wrestlers. There's other good wrestlers back east. So that's where the winning formula came in because he realized he could recruit locally and be able to foster these guys. And eventually you've got it now where he's fostered a dynasty being able to pass on his secrets to these guys who are now going out there and consistently winning, consistently wrestling, you know, where, and Brands too was able to eventually foster that because again he's at Iowa. Big name Iowa wrestlers are going to want to go to Iowa. Other big name wrestlers are going to want to go to Iowa because of the history. So it's there's a big old combination of things that results in these winning formulas. So um, here's another Big Ten team who who recently you know won a national title. Uh, within the last few years, and that's Ohio State. Now, they had four All-Americans, and uh, three of them are going to be coming back uh, this year. Their lone senior that plays, uh, Caleb Romero, registered senior. So um, unless somehow he got eligibility still, he's going to be gone. So, you know, we're looking at um, Carson Karkla. Uh, we're looking at Sammy uh, Sasso, and um, I believe the other one, uh, let me see here. The other one that we had from Ohio State, you had Karkla, Sasso, and uh, Hoffman. Uh, you know, these are these are all guys that are, you know, they're going to be they're sophomore and juniors right now, so they're going to be a little older. But you know, uh, I think even with that, though, probably not 
uh, you know, unless they're like really big names or less, unless you're having like, uh, I, I think, unless you're having guys that are, you know, if you're not really all American, you know, you're not finishing all American that much, you're probably not going to be looking towards next year um, too well, unless you got a promising incoming recruiting class, right? Uh, right. That would be, yeah, that'd be correct. So here's, here's one, here's our first PAC 12, um, team. So, uh, um, and Oregon state, you know, uh, aside from Arizona, Oregon state seemed to have a, a pretty good year, uh, as far as, uh, what they had, you know, I think, uh, overall for, for Oregon state, they ended up having, uh, I think it was either three or four four all americans let's see here so yes they had four all americans they had kaler turner uh willits and willits so and uh so turner is going to be a uh he's a senior so he's outgoing he's from dixon high school in uh, california and then uh uh, other than that, the Willits brothers are both, uh, they're both juniors, so they will be coming back. And then are they twins? Also... What's up with those guys? I'm sorry? Are they twins? What's up with those guys? My guess is they probably are twins. They're probably fraternal uh, twins. That would be my my guess as uh, far as that can that is concerned oh they also still have uh i think they also still have yes they have uh trey muñoz who i think he was one or two matches short of making all american so he'll probably uh be on there he'll probably still be able to um you know make some noise come next year and then brandon kaler was a sophomore this year so he still got two years of eligibility so you know, they may or may not make some noise. They might be able to uh, crack the, the top 10 next year. And uh, one thing I have to point out was that uh, Chris Pendleton, who is the head coach for Oregon State, he was actually, even though um, Arizona State won, if you remember, Matthew, uh, Oregon State kept it pretty close at the Pac-12s and only lost by half a point uh, as far as the team tie was concerned. So Chris Pendleton was named the um, Pac-12 coach of the year uh, for how well the, the team did. But, uh, you know, so I think, uh, you know, they probably, you know, obviously not a title contender, but do you think maybe uh, if they do get some some guys in, do you think the Beavers could uh, crack the top 10 next year? Let's see. Yeah, it looks like they would have enough to be able to um... – crack the, the top 10. So, and, and then... Uh, and again, it depends on their recruiting because you're going to need some of these other guys to be able to uh, to come through. Mm -hmm. in that okay, so then uh, you've got Minnesota finished 11th. And um, obviously they're losing... Um, they're losing Gable. Uh, he's out. He was a senior, and he's going to the uh, WWE. And um, then they also – one of their other All-Americans was Jake Berglund at 141 pounds, and uh, he's a redshirt senior, so it looks like he'll be going out too. Uh, they do have McKee, who was the other All-American. Uh, he plays sixth. And um, he is a redshirt junior, or I'm sorry, he plays fifth. Uh, and then Berglund plays, plays seventh. But so McKee is the junior. He will be coming back, but he's really the only guy who plays for them. So Minnesota is probably going to struggle next year as far as, you know, and they finished 11th because Gable was able to win his title, obviously. You know, uh, winning a title will carry your team pretty far, right? Uh, yeah, a, a title is def definitely brings a uh, team player up on the, the scale. 
because just those wins gets the, the racks up more points and it results in a team generally having a higher score than they would uh, otherwise. So then, um, so if you remember, we had NC State. Uh, they qualified um, all 10 weight classes, I believe it was, to the NCAA tournament. They really dominated at the ACCs, but then they had a collapse. Uh, and they finished 10th, but they did have three All-Americans. Um, they had Tariq Wilson uh, and then uh, Hayden Hidley and Trent Hidley. So another pair of brothers uh, placing uh, All-American. Um, but do you think, Matthew, maybe maybe NC State, uh, they'll probably continue to dominate the ACCs uh, in fashion. Um, but again, it's a matter of how it translates to the NCAA tournament, right? You just can't have collapses even if you're getting all your all your wrestlers to to the tournament. Yeah, getting a, getting as large of a team as possible is definitely important. But being able to have them consistently compete across the board is the second part. You got to get them out there, and then they have to be able to perform. NC State wasn't able to do that. It, you know, on paper, it looked like they had a good uh, chance at it, but then, you know, they weren't able to actually get out there. You need to be able to go out there and perform, which NC State wasn't able to do. <clears throat> so then, um, so then on the strength of a first place finish and a fourth place finish, uh, the team that was able to outdo NC State at ninth place was Missouri. And uh, they had the strength of Rocky Elam, uh, who finished fourth at 197. And then our, our freshman undefeated title winner, Keegan O'Toole. So, Matthew, I think Keegan O'Toole, he's probably going to be a very central, you know, he's going to be a very central figure at Missouri for the next couple of years. You know, that's. He's Keegan O'Toole is probably going to be uh, one of the factors that they're going to be able to sell on getting uh, wrestlers in there. And here's another thing Missouri has always been good at getting wrestlers in there, but and all American national champions, but then. For some reason or another, they haven't been able to – so they're, they're good at individuals, but for some reason as a team, they haven't been good across the board. They were never able to win any kind of a conference until last year they, or this year. They were never able to, you know, put forward a drive to possibly win the, the national championship. It's just one of those weird things where they've always been good at individual wrestlers, not – team wrestling well and i'm going to be really interested uh you know and i will you know i'm in, in my trying to compile you know his historical uh numbers and finishes for you know the ncaa's and aia's you know cif tournaments and stuff so i'm gonna try and compile it's like okay how has everyone done you know what what are all the best finishes of you know some of these non-championship schools and and i'm looking at the roster for missouri Elam himself is a freshman also. So you got two, two freshman All-Americans, you know. Well, and, so. then, and then also the fact that they won the Big 12. Yes. They, they beat other, they <laughs> beat the other thing. teams like Oklahoma State and Iowa State and Oklahoma. So. Well, yeah, you know, it's like because um, I don't know that they really made any noise while they were at the map. I mean, do you thing. they went from a less challenging conference to a more challenging conference and did better, the best that they've ever done. So here, here, here's maybe Matthew. We can th we can think of it this way, at least as far as our mock preview is concerned. Missouri's probably going to be a powerhouse in the Big Twelve for a while, even if they're not, even if they don't win the national title. You know, as, as, and with you know. O'Toole and Elam uh, leading Missouri, and you know if they get other good wrestlers to come in, do you think that at least as far as the Big Twelve is concerned, they're probably going to be in charge of that conference for a while? 
Yeah, unless the unless Oklahoma can come back from their injuries next year and maybe do better. But, you know, again, as I mentioned, the long game. Missouri has an advantage in the long game. So we'll, we'll see how that develops. Yeah. So then, uh, so Virginia Tech uh, seemed to have a, uh, you know, a good finish uh, at the end. Uh, you know, they did place uh, eight. And, uh, you know, Virginia Tech, uh, I believe, belongs to the ACC as well. So, you know, uh, the fact that, hey, uh, they did better than the, than the ACC champions. So that kind of puts that out there, I think. Um, so they, they seem to, to do better. And I'm looking, they had three All-Americans, but... Uh, it almost seems like, oh, yes, and Mekai Lewis was one of their, uh, was their uh, wrestler in the finals. He had gone through some rough times, according to the, uh, excuse me, according to the, um, the broadcast. And he is a junior, so he's going to have another shot at the national title uh, next year. So he will probably be the leader for, Virginia Tech, as, as far as that's concerned. You also had Corbin Myers and Bryce uh, Andonian uh, in there also. Bryce is going to be a, a junior, but it looks like they will lose uh, Corbin Myers because he is a graduate student. Um, but I, it probably will be interesting to see who's going to, who's going to, you know, again, probably not championship caliber teams, but it'll be more down to the conference. Who's going to dominate that conference? You know, Virginia Tech, even North Carolina with uh, Clark. They had Clark uh, really step up the lowest seed since they've seeded all 33 wrestlers in a weight class to make the finals. Um, or, again, we could see, you know, NC State. You know, could they be – it'd be really interesting to see how the ACC ends up doing next year, you know, whether it's, again, Virginia Tech, North Carolina, NC State, Matthew. If you were to guess, you know, I mean, probably be up to whomever, right? Yeah, the, the secondary – the secondary um, uh, race is definitely looking interesting because uh, – Again, long game. You have some teams who've got some younger wrestlers out there. So it'll definitely be interesting seeing how the other guys are doing. So our, our Ivy League school, Cornell, big red machine. Uh, you know, you got uh, Yanni uh, uh, You know, three-time NCAA champion. He's got a he's got a year to go. Uh, if you remember Matthews, a couple years ago, while they had Dake on the team, Cornell got close. They got close to that, uh, you know, to that title. Although you know that was the closest they've gotten. Second, which, yep. which Second. again, which is quite impressive when you think about the Ivy League and having to just recruit based off of. Um, Academics and athletics, and they were able to get second. That 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 was quite impressive. So Yanni, again, he is a junior. He'll be coming back this year. He'll be coming back this upcoming season. He's gonna he's gonna challenge for for becoming. Uh, I believe he's going to be challenging to become the fifth four time NCAA champion. Uh, aside from Pat Smith, Kale. Uh, Logan and Dake, and uh, if Yanni can do it, he he'd make Cornell the first school to have multiple four-time uh, champions. So that that would be something that could maybe uh, you know make people want to go out there. But uh, aside from that, his teammates who also uh, ended up being All Americans, Jonathan Lowe is also a junior, so he's going to be back at, you know, 184, 197 more likely. And then also um, uh, Vito Arajau, who was uh, the – who was at uh, 125s. And uh, he's a sophomore, so 
They got three All-Americans. They're probably going to look good. They'll probably, you know, again, uh, be the champions for the EIWAs, right? And um, and then it's just uh, how, you know, can these – will that then uh, – it's a matter then of uh, just building up their teammates to maybe doing really well at, uh, you know, the NCAAs next year. You think they might have a chance at, a, at cracking the top five? I, I would say so. Um, they've – historically had a good run and you know they've got multiple all americans i'd say it's pretty safe to say that they'll they'll probably crack the top five next year okay so uh northwestern uh i believe was the yes northwestern uh was the uh sixth place and uh, overall so you know so who do they have who did they have to place, and then who did they have to? Uh, so overall, they had four All Americans, with Ryan Deacon uh, being the national champion. Uh, as you remember, he faced Quincy Monday, who was the son of uh, Kenny Monday, who was a successful uh, coach and wrestler at Oklahoma State. So. Uh, as far as Deacon is concerned, uh, are we seeing him back? Uh, he is a graduate student, so it means that we're probably not going to be seeing him back uh, for the upcoming year. Um, and, you know, again, how does this translate to, you know, the other guys? Are they going to have the other guys uh, going to be able to compete? Hard to say. Uh, you know how it is. Uh, I believe Northwestern is a, a Big Ten school. So, you know, not really, I would say, a run for, uh, what is it, the NCAA title or the Big Ten title. Uh, I've never really seen Northwestern uh, get that high. But, uh, you know, it seems that they did have a, a good run as far as, you know, a, a top six finish is nothing to laugh at, don't you think? Yeah, top six in, in NCAA D1 is pretty respectable. And this is one, another one of those times where they probably just had all the best wrestlers that they've had. Um, mm -hmm. Whether they'd be able to replicate that is another thing entirely. So one of their, uh, their All-Americans, Chris Cannon, at 133s, he is a, a sophomore. So it looks like we will be seeing him back. Uh, then the other ones, such as uh, D'Agostino and uh, Davison. So D'Agostino is a senior, so it looks like they're going to be losing him. And so uh, also Andrew Davison is a graduate student. So it means that they're more than likely they're going to be losing three out of their four uh, All-Americans um, for the upcoming year. So they've got to they be. A big hill to climb if they want to repeat their performance from this year, right? Well, like I said, I, I'm, I'm from the sound of it, this looked like it might have been an isolated occurrence. And if they're losing all Americans, I, I doubt they're gonna get that high at least anytime soon. I mean, obviously, surprises can happen. We saw a lot of them this last year, but it, it's highly unlikely, I'll put it that way. Okay, so uh, Nebraska, you know. Nebraska's been competitive um, always, and they've got – they had five All-Americans. Now, uh, Ridge Lovett uh, ended up making the, uh, the finals, and uh, he took second. Uh, he is a sophomore, so we are going to be seeing him back. Uh, then if you look at uh, some of the other people, you got Peyton Robb, uh, Labriola, Schultz, and Lance. Uh, some of these guys, uh, you know, Labriola is a, uh, he is a junior. Lance is a senior, so he's going to be out. So is Schultz. Uh, and then uh, our last wrestler that we were, that I was trying to look at was uh, Lance, I believe. And uh, actually, no, that was not the one. So they're going to have some guys leaving, uh, you know, and obviously that's, uh, it's, unless you've got uh, other guys coming in. So they may or may not be able to, to repeat last year. 
And um, so then we'll look at Arizona State, Matthew. Arizona State and, uh, you know, they they had quite the run, you know. They were short of, uh, of a top three finish. But, uh, you know, I think it's been the best – Best finish by a Pac-12 school in quite a long time, uh, you know. And uh, Oregon State almost, you know, made it two uh, in the top ten, but just a top five finish. I mean, what a what a journey uh, that these guys had to go through. Yeah, the last time that I could think of, and I might be wrong, um, but the last time I could think of that a Pac-12 uh, back the, the Pac-10 back then school. Um, was in the top five was probably Bakersfield when they got third behind Iowa State and Iowa. I think that was in 98 or 99. So, so obviously their leader uh, this time around was Colton Schultz, who placed second uh, at the in the heavyweight, lost to Gable Stevenson. Uh, but Gable's not around, so Colton will have the opportunity to to try and take the title. Um, you know, he's pretty gnarly in his moves, and I lo- I watched the uh, you know if you watch the match between him and uh, and um, Jordan Wood from Lehigh, you know, he just had some. He's pretty slick in how he moved and stuff, and I think that just comes from his uh, his Greco experience. And uh, but you know, I think it. I, it almost seems to me, Matthew, that uh, I think they're going to get pretty serious w- come next year. Well, yeah, think- we, we, we talked about this. They have a young team. And um, another thing to remember is that their coach, Zeke Jones, he was uh, part of that uh, Arizona State championship team under Bobby Douglas. Now, obviously, Kale was a pop- Bobby Douglas pupil as well. We've seen what he's been doing. Zeke Jones has obviously had a longer road to this, but I think he knows the, the appropriate formula to being in a school that's not traditionally known for their wrestling and being able to build towards it. Again, I keep bringing up the long game, but this is the long game. He's able to get these wrestlers. He's been able to develop them, and it's gotten to the point where here it is, you know, fourth last year. Most of their guys are all coming back. so. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to be um, this year. I don't know if it's going to be next year. I don't know if it's even going to happen. But I'd say if there's any time for Arizona State to win a, a national championship, it's going to be within the next few years. So you got Schultz, obviously, freshman. Uh, <coughs> Courtney uh, at 125, McGee 133. They're both juniors. So very good shot for them uh, to be trying to come back. Uh, you've got Teamer. Uh, if I were to look uh, for him, him, Teamer, he's a sophomore. And then, um, you know, Parco, who was 49, he's a freshman. So, five All Americans, they're all coming back next year. Again, like you're saying, I, it could be, you know, within the next year or two, it could be a now or never situation for them. And, and they, I think, um, let me see if uh, he's still. So Valencia, they are going to lose uh, Anthony Valencia. He did not quite make, um, you know, making um, All-American uh, this time around. But if I'm looking at everything, a- at least on their roster, Matthew, the only senior they're losing is Valencia. So... We could be seeing some of the other guys who uh, didn't necessarily place also do well. So, it, it, like I said, <laughs> this is the first opportunity in a while that we've seen Arizona. Let, let's put it this way. This is the first opportunity in a while that we've seen a non-Big Ten or Big 12 school be put in. Well, I, I shouldn't say that because we just talked about Cornell might get into the finals, but placing second so i guess west area is probably the best way to put it so probably more than likely though this team will this 
they will definitely be the the number one contender for the Pac-12 title next year. I I think, or, or I think Oregon can give them a good run for their money, but I think definitely, you know, the the odds would be in favor of Arizona State. As as it said in the Hunger Game, may the odds be ever in so in your favor. So let's look at uh, and then third place Iowa. So again, Iowa uh, they they kind of struggled and and you know some of it did have to do with the injuries. Um, you know they lost a lot of guys just out in the round of 16. Uh, they would then have to lose some guys out in you know in the semifinals, quarterfinals. Um, in the end, let's see here. They had, I think, five, no, six All Americans, um, but and uh, they had one finalist. And um, you know, it's tough when you it's tough when you're when you lose guys out in the quarters, round of sixteens, the semis. When you're not getting them into the finals, that's where it hurts. Um, but if I'm looking at what they have here, like a lot of their really good guys, DeSanto, uh, Spencer Lee, Marinelli, um, Murren, uh, I think was another name on here. I think, you know, uh, they're losing all – just with seniors alone, they're losing 12 seniors off their roster. So they probably got a lot of building to do for next year. Um I think a top top ten finish at least is is safe. Uh, again, this is just uh, hypothetical right now. Um, but when you lose that many seniors, it's kind of it's uh, you got a tough road to climb, a uh, tough tough mountain to climb, right? Yeah, when you think of like when you think of an NCAA team, their roster cap is at 30. So 12, that's a third of your team, almost half. So that's that's experience that you're you're losing. And um, and then yeah, all those, you know, all the performances that those guys have done, it's it's uh, that's 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 hard. And then um, as we're closing out here um so Michigan the uh the big run that they had uh where it was you know they pulled the upset at the Big Tens uh first title in a while um and hey they they really gave Penn State you know they really tried to challenge them on that and um I think overall how many guys do we have one Two, three, four, five, six. Six All Americans with uh, one champion, one finalist. Um, but you know, I think if if they were if they were going to come close, this was it. Because um, Suriano, uh, he came in as a graduate student, and uh, this was his last opportunity. So Suriano is out. I know that store, uh, they have Kane in store who he didn't make the tie. He did not make championships, but I know that he was their wrestler at, um, I think it was 149. He didn't make it, but he placed eighth at the big tens. So I know that he's out. Um, I think there was a, another wrestler. Um, I think my was the 41 pounder. Um, I think he was knocked out early in the tournament. He didn't make all American. But he's the graduate. Um, Miles Amin, I know, is a – he was a graduate also. Five-time NCAA All-American. And uh, I just saw something for UWW that he, he won the uh, – he won the European Championships. Um, you know, he does uh, – he uh, represents – I think it was San Marcos is the country that uh, he represents. Uh, but he's out. So – you know this. This was, um, you know, this was the run that that Michigan uh, wanted to do, and they they tried to do what they could 
but they do have a lot of uh, outgoing seniors. So probably, Matthew, we're not going to see this kind of uh, run from them come next year. They probably will be competitive, probably, a, you know, maybe a top three finish at Big Tens. But, you know, when you're losing a lot of your a lot of your uh, key components from this this last year it's going to be tough right yeah as we established a bunch of the guys are leaving and like you know like yeah. like i mean you couldn't have put it better i mean you're 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 taking people away and it's just going to take away from your success in the future because that means you have to fill in those slots and you have to rebuild and it doesn't really look like they have anyone to fill them out unless their bench is strong, but we'll just have to wait and see how that all goes. Yeah, we'll have to wait. And see. So lastly, obviously, Penn State. Uh, so they do have uh, some outgoing wrestlers. Um, now, again, RBY is among those wrestlers, but I was seeing a post somewhere that said that he might have eligibility. Now, I would find that hard to believe unless he hasn't used his COVID eligibility yet. So I don't know. That's, that's again, that's kind of a, a, a weird one. So I'm, you know, I'm not going to say or say, so I'm going to assume that RBY is out, but even with the loss of, of RBY, they're still going to have four returning national champions. And that alone, I think, is going to, you know, going to really uh, be something uh, for them coming up in this in this upcoming year, right? Uh, it's it's hard to argue around that in in my mind. And um, I think one of their they they also had another. Where is Kirk uh, Vliet? Because I know. And Kirk Vliet, who was their heavyweight, he, he did finish uh, fourth, and uh, he's a sophomore. So they've, they're going to have four returning national champions. They're going to have another returning All-American. So it, it looks pretty good for them as far as, you know, if we were to just with how things are going right now, they could be, you know, uh, are we seeing the beginning of another four, Pete, Matthew? Uh I would probably say so, because uh, yeah, again, he we're we're talking. That's one thing that Kale has been really good at is that these uh, these rest these groups of wrestlers that are, um, you know, he's able to get these repeating groups of of all Americans and national champions. And there's a lot of overlap, and he's able to bring these guys on multiple years. So it's one of those things. That's part of his success is that he's able to get these guys, hold on to these guys, and they're able to come on year to year, win championships, win in. So, yeah, he's, he's got an All-American. He's got four returning national champions. The, I'd say it's, the likelihood is very high that he gets another title and probably a few more down the line. As, so, at, at least looking good for a repeat title next year. Yeah, at least a repeat. Okay, so again, Matthew, thanks for the commentary on that. Um, so I just want to close out our um, the, the, the episode today with, uh, I guess, kind of uh, what's what would consider what would be considered to be kind of a controversial uh, topic that has come up, and this was actually uh, proposed by the NCAA. So I'm going to screen share uh, real quick to kind of, um, and I've tried to read through this just to see how it all plays out, and uh, just get your opinion on what you think about this, and um, you know what. What effect it'll have on on our sport as a whole. So, uh, do you see this uh, the NCAA page? So, um, Division One proposal 
2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2
How does the proposal support student athlete success well-being? This proposal would strengthen student athlete success as it would allow institutional staff members involved with RTCs to focus their attention on current student athletes. Uh, no budget impact, uh, no, no impact on student athletes' time. Uh, so again, they want to, uh, this was, it was, and, and it looks like this has been in the works for a long time. It was delayed by COVID. Uh, they were ready to vote uh, last uh, in February, but it looks like they uh, did not. And then there was a proposal uh, clarifying that it applies only to men's wrestling. So in short, Matthew, the NCAA is saying that uh, they're going to regulate the RTCs uh, and they, they do not want prospective athletes or recruits uh, coming into the RTCs. That's what it sounds like to me. Matthew, your take on that. You know, is the NCAA overstepping its bounds? Yes. This is the, this <clears throat> this has absolutely nothing to do with them. This if if it, if this is all about RTCs, then they have no business regulating this. This this is like like th these guys aren't even competing. It, it's like. This has no significance to, to competition. It says so in the thing. Like, and how in the world are they supposed to get new athletes? Like, how, how are these regional training centers supposed to get new athletes? Like, what, what, are, what are they thinking? So I think um, I think the NCAA because I think some of some of the schools are actually running the RTCs. That that from what I've been reading, which is why the NCAA is trying to get themselves involved with this. Um, again, though, you know I think this <coughs> comes down to another you know mishap by the NCAA where. Again, hey, we've seen what they they've done in the past, and they they are really not. They're not friendly when it comes to men's wrestling. You know, we bent over backwards for them. You know, we've been bringing up women's wrestling, and then they're bringing this on us. This uh, is a power play. They, they don't like our sport. No. They, they, they don't like our sport. They, they've all, it's like they've, they've done so many things to hamstring it. Now this is just their way of getting more control over something that is that has nothing to do with the athletic season. These, these guys probably aren't even, it's like we could be talking about, you know, these, these training centers probably, it's, we're probably talking about the clubs. We're talking about, we're probably talking about the wrestling clubs. We're A lot of them are, yes. We're, we're talking about, I, we're talking about the, I, well, you know, Iowa WC, New York eight. I, oh, I don't know if there's one in New York AC. But well, yeah, the whatever the Penn State one is, like I think it's like the Lion AC or something like. I think that. it's Nittany Lion Club. We're talking. We're talking about. We are. It's like we're talking about pro programs that uh, that run outside of, of it's. Like well, and, and uh, you know, it's like how are you supposed to? How are you? <laughs> attract how are you supposed to attract prospective wrestlers to your if you school can't if you can't recruit say someone retired how do you fill that spot yeah so i you know at this least is, from what this is this saying is absolutely ludicrous if you want to if you want to force these clubs to move to like off off campus somewhere sure by all means, enact it. Uh, like, I don't know if that's what their goal is. Or if you want to give business to the NAIA, then by all means. But this is ludicrous. This has, this has absolutely nothing to do with the NCAA. This is outside of season. This, this, this has nothing to do with them. This is crap. So... Uh, there is a letter, yeah, 
No, I, I get it. I'm looking at this. I'm thinking, well, you know, again, this is another overreach, in my opinion, by the NCAA. And uh, past, litigation needs to start immediately. Immediately. By USA Wrestling. So um, the United States Olympic uh, and Paralymp Paralympic Committee penned an open letter to uh, the NCAA Division I Council. Uh, addressed, uh, let me see, it was written on March 25th. Addressed to Mr. Shane Lyons, who is the chairman of uh, the NCAA Division I Council. Dear Mr. Lyons, on behalf of the USOPC Collegiate Advisory Council and USA Wrestling Leaders, we're asking the NCAA D1 Council to delay action on NCAA Proposal 2019-50 during the April 13-14 meeting. The letter outlines the regional training center history and why more vetting is needed given the landscape changes that have occurred since the proposal was conceived. Our shared stakeholders are concerned that this proposal will negatively impact elite prospective student athlete opportunities and may stifle women's wrestling growth. As proposed, this legislation will not resolve the broader recruiting abuses. Rather, it will diminish national team development opportunities for our country's elite student athletes. So it seems to me that, I mean, judging by this first paragraph, and again, you don't hear about this often when it comes to wrestling because I don't think, you know, they're as, I don't think they would be as sleazy when it comes to trying to recruit, you know, wrestlers as it comes to some of the other money-making sports, you know, like football and uh, basketball. So it seems to me that the NCAA is concerned about, uh, you know, that uh, maybe some things were going on, uh, off on the wrong end uh, in, in regards to getting, um, you know, recruits into these training centers. Now, again, if you remember, this thing says that it was proposed in, in the year 2019. So this is three years ago, which means that, which means that when this was proposed, and I'm very sure that USA Wrestling was notified Whatever NCAA Division I body that oversees wrestling was notified. The U.S. Uh, you know, OPC was notified about this. So by this opening statement, they have been trying to make changes to making RTCs, I don't know, more satisfactory to how the NCAA wants it. And they're and they're and they're notice and they're noting this here from 82 to 2008 there have been 55 55 D1 programs dropped um, uh, and uh, you know there were fears that college wrestling would soon be eliminated similar to college boxing uh, and then on the heels of the 2008 crisis, uh, 12 more programs were dropped from uh, D1 between 2008 and 2012. Uh, and they're saying that this is where during this time, um, you know, they decided to go, they, they uh, made the RTC route, which would in a way, I guess, help alleviate the fact that, you know, you had program, you know, programs were harder and harder to come by uh, is what it seems. Uh, the RTC model is intended to aid in elite development by allowing athletes, uh, which is uh, PSA is prospective student athletes, which are incoming recruits. Uh, then you have college and then you have elite, which I'm going to assume is that they are, they probably are in college, but they are trying to compete on the world level uh, also. So, to train together in freestyle Greco uh, versus the folk style used in college. RTC started with two school training programs in 2009. It grew to 20 schools in 2012, and the network now stands at 44 schools as of 2021. So 44 schools have RTCs across the country. Um, so I guess in a way, the RTCs are involved with, you know, the schools, 
Uh, let me see. D1 programs are standing at 78 teams uh, as of 2021, with momentum being added to the women's wrestling. Annually, there are over 1,000 elite prospective college and national team athletes benefiting from the RTC model. And many college stakeholders are proud of the Olympic development opportunities afforded to men and women through the RTC program and believe collaboration is needed to address the non-elite recruiting concerns that brought about proposal 2019-50. You know, something I'm gonna point out is that I think this long-term, we can see the long-term success in the, the, the college level athletes winning Olympic gold medals. Like the last few Olympics, we've had college athletes winning Olympic uh, medals. Mm -hmm. Gable Stevenson was the latest one, obviously. Yeah. But so, that, that change uh, just goes to show what, what, the, what, how much of a success it is. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure how forcibly changing this model would benefit the college athletes, if they want to be successful, you know, if they really want to be successful on the national, well, not, not just on the national, but on the international stage, I don't know how stifling this is going to benefit them in the long run. So, um, again, hey, I, I see this as controversial. Obviously, you are in complete agreement with me on this. It, it you know, whatever they're, Whatever the NCAA is thinking, and you know we we've, we've been down this road. We've seen how the, uh, you know, again, like you said, the NCAA does not like men's wrestling. They they just don't, and um, you know it's unfortunate that they. Well, we can see that from the four year transition that. Uh, yeah, they 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 forced through, forced it wrestling it program. Right. Yeah, they forced wrestling programs to go through a four year um, transition. It's just not fair. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, hate to close out, you know, the the um, close it out on a, such a controversial topic on on something like this, which is why, um, you know, to any of our listeners or to anyone who, um, you know, really has insight about this, um, we'd like to offer an open invitation to anyone who has more insight onto. Um, NCAA Division I Proposal 2019-50. Uh, we'd like to invite anyone who wants to, you know, again, we're really small, but um, an open invitation to anyone who wants to come on to our podcast and, and um, you know, maybe who has more insight about this, what, what, why the NCAA decided that they wanted to do this, you know, what the implications are going to be, what, what is the history behind the NCAA wanting to, to seemingly regulate the RTCs, you know, how the RTCs have grown. We'd really like to get, you know, uh, some insight on this. And, and we really hope that, you know, this would, you know, just, just regulating it like the NCAA is proposing, at least the way that we're interpreting this is not great. So again, um, if you'd like to uh, reach out to us, um, you know, we're, we are, you um, very open to uh, having someone on the on the podcast, uh, you know, to uh, just discuss this and um, you know the the ways that you can find us. Um, again, uh, for us, uh, if you want uh, through here, let me see here. Where is it? So I believe, Matthew, I had set our, yes. Okay, anyone uh, who wants to maybe reach out to us, uh, our email address is Samurai Bros Wrestling. And uh, Matthew, um, when you're editing this, maybe if you can uh, just put the uh, address up for uh, everyone to see it. Uh, you know, anyone who wants to come on the program to talk about this, uh, you know, just email us samurai bros wrestling at gmail.com. We'd really like to know uh, more about this and, and how it's going to affect, you know, affect the, 
you know, college athletes, you know, as far as wrestling is concerned, um, you know, or you can uh, reach out to, uh, to Matthew on his various um, social media too. We'd really like to know. Uh, so again, an open invitation to anyone who wants to come onto the podcast and uh, discuss this. So uh, with that being said, Matthew, um, you know, uh, hopefully when we, when we come back, um, next time in our next episode a uh, lot more to talk about the u.s open is going to be coming up here uh very shortly so that's going to be interesting to see how that goes uh there's a lot more people that have signed up uh but with that being said um we're going to go ahead and uh, close out this episode uh uh again matthew uh where can you find where where can people find us um as far as our podcast goes Okay, for the video uh, podcast, we are on YouTube and Rumble. And for the audio podcast, we are on ACAST, Apple, Spotify, and Google. More platforms to be added. And then Matthew is also the, uh, he is one of the executive editors um, for uh, his MMA uh, website. It's called uh, MMA Freak. Uh, so you can find, uh, if you want to visit him on the website at mma freak Dot com and uh, he is also on uh, Twitter also uh, at Matthew Salzer and uh, then also uh, he you can also follow the official MMA freak uh, Twitter uh, MMA freak out is going to be the uh, official Twitter and again uh, to all our viewers again open invitation um, if uh, you know, we also want to uh, bring on anyone who just wants to talk about wrestling. If you are interested, drop us an email, Samurai Bros Wrestling uh, at gmail.com. You know, if uh, anybody wants to talk about NCAA uh, proposal 2019 50, or if anyone just wants to come on and talk about, you know, uh, your experiences uh, having wrestled and uh, how that has really impacted your life, uh, you know, for better or for worse. So uh, with that being said, um, I think, uh, Matthew, uh, I think we'll be taking a break uh, for Easter next week uh, just to kind of let let uh, news develop and uh, things. And uh, so um, we'll be coming back in, in two weeks uh, to, again, uh, see how things are going. By then, we'll know how the... Uh, uh, you know, we'll be seeing how the uh, U.S. Open will be opening up and stuff. But uh, again, uh, thank you all uh, for joining us on this journey. And uh, we will continue to bring you updates and stuff. So, Matthew, as always, thank you very much for your uh, commentary. Uh, you provide valuable insight to everything that's going on. Uh, so with that being said... Uh, we will be going ahead and signing out, and uh, we will be seeing you in uh, two weeks. So take care, everyone.